All right, Simon. Always a pleasure, man. This the boys are back again. The boys are back in town. <laughs> I'll drink Looks to like, that. You drink to that. Looks like you're feeling much better, which is great. I am. It is it's night and day. You know, all I um just recently got back from the gym and whoo <laughs> yeah. recouping from the Epstein bar takes so long for me, you know, in my personal case of it. And anyway, so I'm, I was just, I got home and I was telling my kids, I was like, you know, the workout I did today would have been a warm up, and yeah. it, you know, when I'm feeling good, but I am just, it just kicked my butt so bad, you know, <laughs> it's understandable. So, yeah. Oh yeah. Still, still recouping, but feeling way better. Good. Well, you, you look, your color looks good. Everything's great. <laughs> and uh you know trump got indicted he got it on all 34 counts he's guilty that that, that, that must be why i'm in, looking so healthy <laughs> i only talk about this stuff with you online just so you know <laughs> that's so funny you know um somebody who i just a, a, as a human being i just respect the hell out of and they're a, a friend that we have here and they're helpful and kind and thoughtful and all these kind yeah. of uh, things. But immediately after, uh, you know, the, the ruling came down, um, you know, this individual posted on their social media, I'm more MAGA now than ever. <laughs> and I'm just like, mm. wow. It just goes to show that even the best people you know can get really brainwashed yeah. by bullshit, you it's know? True. Yeah. And actually, I think it's kind of like even just talking about it, it's um, it's funny how people take things and it's a human condition thing of that. If you're for something and somebody questions it or offends it, you dig deeper into it. It's not like, oh, you've seen the light. You go deeper into it. It's just very Man. strange thing that people do. You know? I have been having this experience, this exact experience that you're describing. I've been having over and over uh, in the past you know, month or two and with people who I'm very, um, close with. And just a couple of days ago, I had a, a three hour conversation with somebody on the phone and, um, it was, you know, I'm doing my nightly walk I, I walk Eeyore and the goal each night is, uh, at, at least three miles. Normally it takes like an hour or so, you know, whatever. Um, but anyway, so I intended to speak with this person during that duration, but we ended up, I ended up just keep walking I, and, and we ended up uh, talking for three hours uh, and debating several things about uh, uh, religious questions specific to Mormonism, but, but, uh, but most of them uh, could be generalized into general Christian, you know, uh, points and everything. And what I was trying to help this person see is not that I am definitively right and they are definitively wrong, but that there is a lot more nuance to their argument, to the things that they were arguing than they wanted to admit. They wanted it to be black and white. And I was trying to demonstrate that it's all shades of gray. But the more I tried to demonstrate nuance and that not and once again, not that I am right, but that th they are not unequivocally right either. So both of us are probably wrong, in other words, but we're just wrong in the subtleties of all these things. Um, but yeah, the, the more we talk, the more that they would just dig in, dig in, dig in, dig in, and they would end up, you know, over and over again, just like bearing their testimony, you know? Yeah there's no polite way to say it and so the, i always just say you know to people listen your testimony's bunk yeah. i mean it is so because your testimony won't hold up in court because your testimony is based on i feel feelings don't hold up in court no so the difference between what they were arguing and what i was arguing is that every point that I was making was verifiable. You can open your Bible and see that what I said, the Bible said, is right.
but they were saying, no, I don't believe that. I was like, and I, and I would invite them over and over. It's like, well, go ahead and open the Bible. It's right there. You don't have to believe me. I am not asking you to believe me. I am not telling you to believe me. I'm not telling you that, oh, I feel this so strongly, so it must be true. I'm saying you can open the book and read it for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> and like, well, I just don't believe it says that. I just don't believe you. Like, who the hell cares what you believe? <laughs> open the Bible and read it, my friend. <laughs> I don't, you, you can believe whatever you want about what you think the Bible says. Just open it up to the chapter and verse and read it. And then you'll know that you were incorrect and that I was correct about what the Bible is saying. Now, your interpretation of that, what the Bible is saying might be different. And that's when we talk about nuance and all these different things. We might have to look further into the, the when and the where and the how this particular scripture was written. And we might have to, you know, you know, search deeper into that. But just to say, oh, I don't believe the Bible says that because you don't think that's true. Well, I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> it's hard I'm to just trying to, I'm trying to think of the nicest way to say it, yeah. but all, all I can think of are expletives, you know? <laughs> well, you know what, this is, I think you may find this interesting. Uh, and, and as a disclaimer, when I say this, this is not meant to be mean or nasty. I'm not a mean person. That's not my thing. This, mm -hmm. this is factual information. And one of the things I've been thinking about is like, what's the disconnect with and this isn't just politics and anything, politics, religion, uh, medicine, whatever it is, healthcare. What is the disconnect, this cognitive dissonance of explaining something to someone and they just can't get out of their way about like, oh, the light bulb doesn't go on. But, you know, mm -hmm. factually speaking, we know statistically in the United States that uh, a good 15% of our population has an IQ like 80 or below. All right. So yeah. th th again, this is not a disparaging remark. This is just reality. It happens. And I often wonder, is it that sometimes the we say, well, we can't get these people out of this mindset, but what if they can't get out of the mindset because they just actually can't? Like mm -hmm. they don't have the mental processing power to actually know they're in this situation or to actually think critically from concrete operations to formal operations. I think that's uh, um, actually a really kind analysis. I know some people might think that that's really mean spirited yeah. to say, you know, because in essence, you're saying people are stupid and not in the insulting way that we normally use that word, but the defining way defining. that the, yeah, yes. and, and, and stupid it, by definition is an inability to learn. Right. So we're if if we can just strip away the negative context from that and just say different people have different capacities. Correct. Yes. Um. So, do you think? And, and obviously, this is all speculative. Yeah. If, if you were asked the question, do you believe that that's more nature or nurture? What what would you think about low IQ individual, generally speaking? I would say generally uh, there is some some nurture to it, but I think there's just some there is an innate element to some people's processing. I don't know. How, I'm saying it like computer wise. I think it's just kind no, of. No, I think it's. I, I think right? it's a good like, analogy. There yeah. may be there. There is some level of the software hardware just cannot handle the. The, inf the the stimulation of the process it can't compute all of the information yeah. and then use it and then create this um theory or analysis about it and that's not a slam against people that's just it is what mm -hmm. it is for that like i do not have great processing power when it comes to math like i just don't see it the way someone who goes oh you know this trigonometry this yeah. obtuse triangle like to me i see it and it doesn't come it does it looks really weird to me mm -hmm. whereas someone it's a foreign else sees, language it's foreign to me I'm, and as much as yeah. i try and i've gotten so much tutoring and stuff different math calculus doesn't make sense to me none of that stuff makes sense to me no matter what i've done there's a processing issue for me how i my brain understands this and i don't think we're assigning this enough to these type of extreme behaviors maybe it's a processing issue i, I know that sounds bad but i don't think it is though 
I don't think it is either because, you know, we, we all have different strengths and weaknesses. And I think right. that's just readily apparent, you know, not everybody's equal in every way. Right. I'm not, you know, I don't know why Bo Jackson first came to mind, but you know, he was an all around athlete. He's playing football, baseball, and, yeah. and you know, uh, and he's pretending to play guitar with Bo Diddley, right. but you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> But I'm saying I don't have that athletic aptitude to ever become a Bo Jackson. Right. Um, you know, I can train as hard as I want. I can hire the best coaches on the planet. I'm not going to be Bo Jackson, right? You know, or or, or anybody of that elite caliber. It's it's just not going to happen. Um, I can get as good as I can get. Yes. yes. But that's that that's not going to be at the same level. It's just not. You know, right. So we're, maybe, we're, maybe this is the same thing we're talking about, right? This is yeah. maybe maybe when you're talking to someone, one of the real realizations you may get instead of shouting with people back and forth and getting these whipped up things is to realize, like, maybe this isn't I can't really engage with this person, because if I'm giving them something really formalized operations, the hypothetical, what about this? about this what if this didn't happen and they just go well it didn't happen well this is what it is i immediately know we can't have a higher level conversation about this because they just don't have the processing power to do that and i once again i'm going to say i think that's a really kind it's a there's a really benevolent way to look at it because uh the um alternative that most of us including my, myself included go to is like, man, why are you so such an idiot? Yeah. You know, why, why can't you just see the, th the things the way I see yeah. them? <laughs> right, know? right. Which, right. which is a really selfish and self centered uh, worldview. Why doesn't everybody else see the world like I do? Yeah, I mean, thank God, that not everybody sees the world the way I do. Yeah. And, and, and I say that not because I think I have a bad worldview, but because I really believe in diversity. Yeah. You know, yeah. and we need a diverse, uh, you know, uh, uh, sampling of humanity in order for us to be able to progress the way that we we want to in different aspects of life. Yeah. Shannon and I were just in New Orleans uh, the other weekend, um, spent like three days there, you know, and, uh, you know, exploring the French Quarter and going to different uh, museums and things like that. And and um, at their main art museum there, uh, just outside the art museum, they have this beautiful sculpture garden. And by that, I don't mean like the plants are sculpted. You know, it's not like, mm -hmm. you know, shrubs being sculpted. It's 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 a, a beautiful garden park. And then they have all these amazing sculptures uh made out of you know all, all different kinds of things and in all different i mean there's glass sculptures there's mirror sculptures there's you know of course your classic bronze and things like that but just incredible and the variety there and and the way that everybody's working in these different mediums and they have different ideas and, and all, i mean it it was so inspiring to me and to shannon as well just to see how many people are creating just incredible works of art. Yeah. Just incredible. And, and and it's even a little, there's a point in which you feel, at least I do, as as somebody who's, you know, just trying to be creative all the time, it, it, you feel a little bit small. Yeah. There was a painting inside the museum and I just stared at it for so long and I was, looking at every minute detail. And I was just so awestruck by it. And I spent the bulk of my time in the museum with that painting. And um, I was inspired by it. I was delighted by it. I was awestruck by it. And then I was also, it was like this, like this feeling of hopelessness that mm. I will never create something that beautiful. Yeah that That's masterful right. it made me feel so mediocre mm. but in a way that inspired me to to get better to challenge myself to be more and i think that's what witnessing greatness should do 
you know, that's what Jesus should do, inspire sure. us to be more, you know, that's what the Buddha should do. That's what all these, you know, yeah. great teachers and leaders should do. The frustrating thing that I have when I have a conversation with somebody who I will just go out, go ahead and say it, I am intellectually superior to, mm -hmm. is that there is a there is something I'm lacking in my presentation that is not inspiring. Sometimes it does. Sometimes I find the right person, you know, the, the right kind of individual yeah. that, you know, my thought process and my ideas and my worldview inspires them. They might not even agree with me, but but it inspires them to think a little deeper, look a little deeper. These kinds of, the frustrating part for me is when I'm dealing with somebody who I, I, I just can't figure out how to have that effect on. Mm. You know, I can't figure. Yeah. And once again, I'm not asking them to agree with me. I'm not asking them to to adopt my worldview, but I'm 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 just asking them to look a little deeper. Yeah. And to and to not make simplistic definitive statements as if that's everybody else's reality yeah yeah so I, don't, I don't know i don't know where i'm missing i don't know what i you know but it's it's something for me personally to look inward and think about yeah. how can i do a better job in my presentation of in, to inspire others around me just to think deeper right to look deeper that's an interesting way of putting that. How do you meet the communication needs of different people? Right? Yeah. And again, this is not like, a, again, I because I think that you and I both, we really care about people, but you kind of know when you're talking to someone, kind of, man, I want to be really nice about this, but like where they land in terms mm -hmm. of being able to have critical thinking, right? Again, yeah. not a slam, just like you, you feel it, right? It's like, this is a this is an extreme example, but I also think very relevant for time. Like I always tell people, like when you know when they broadcast a TV show or an interview, often a lot of organizations will pick a person who is the most sensationalized person, or honestly not the most intelligent person from a street. You know, you remember those interviews, and it's always someone who has really poor command of whatever language they're speaking or they're dressed really, uh, you know, in a way that would not suggest that they have a lot of means or that they're, something is off there. It's like I always say, when I see somebody wearing the American flag on their shirt or a hat and their pants and their shoes, I honestly think very differently about that person because there's something missing with decorum and understanding respectfulness of other people's ideas and how that comes across. To general, mm -hmm. like there, you just know immediately. Yeah. You ever start talking to someone and you just immediately, you just know this is not great. This is, oh, yeah. This is, you yeah. know what I mean? I don't know. I'm, I'm not yeah. saying this well, I think you can probably say this better. No, no, I, I, I agree with you completely. I, I, um, there was an individual back in Portland who attended the same church that we did who, um, was really big in, into like conspiracy theories. Yeah. yeah. I bumped into him in the grocery store one time and you're going to love this because being a black person, mm -hmm. he started telling me about how black people don't have a, a high enough IQ to understand, you know, and to be able to compete with white people, you know, and blah, 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 wow. all this, all, all, all this stuff. In Portland? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, you know, I, and, and just at the grocery store and nothing I mean, it was like, hi, hello, hey, black people are dumb. Wow. You know, I mean, I mean, that's really, that's really like, uh, like how how it kind of went. You know, that's wow. not a, a, much of an exaggeration at all. Yeah. And so you run into somebody like that, and and of course, I could have stood there and called out all of that BS. Yeah. And told him, you know, what an ignorant, stupid thing that is yeah. to 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 say or believe. But I knew I wasn't nothing I would say would change his mind. I mean, that type of person, yeah, you know, uh, there, there's nothing I can do. There, there, there's nothing I can say, you know, yeah. so it's just like, so I, I just very politely told him to say, well, I don't believe what you're saying, but, you know, I, I guess to each their own. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? What's an aisle just, five? <laughs> yeah, I mean, just like uh, I'm just here for the cheese. You know, that's <laughs> all. You know, I you mean, didn't come for this racial. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it's just you just it, know, it, though. I, you know, you feel it yeah, immediately. Again, I'm exactly. Trying, like you just know, it's not like you're all better than this. Just like it's very difficult to try to have an analytical hey, maybe think about it from this point of view conversation when there is like a trap, like the mind is trapped in its own processing deficiency for mm -hmm. that. You can't do it. And then there's the other side to me, which is the other swing, which is high intelligence, but making decisions purely for evil reasons and for selfish reasons. And this is the other side to me personally that you know better but you don't do better because it it in, it enhances your life in some external way that even if you know it's bad, you still make the bad decision because there's some other reward for you in it. That That's perfect because, you know, one of the main points of conversation that I was having with this person uh, two days ago um, was what Mormons call the word of wisdom. Are you familiar with I'm that? Familiar. I think we've, I think we've talked, but maybe not. So, Anyway, it's basically a health code. It was um, uh, Mormons, of course, believe that uh, it was given to Joseph Smith directly by revelation from God. Um, and basically, it's it's all the things that you think of when you think of Mormon. You don't drink, you don't smoke, you don't drink coffee, black tea. Now, however, that's just part of it. Those are the don't do's. Now, the things that get ignored by 99% of the population, and that includes the Mormon population, is what to do. And it's and it says, you know, to eat um, fruits and grains, those are for the body, you know, basically, it promotes a vegetarian lifestyle, and it does so very explicitly. And the, the way Joseph Smith dictated it is, you know, God speaking, first person, you know, I, this is what I want you to do. And uh, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but uh, um, God tells Joseph Smith eat, to eat meat sparingly. And then he goes on to say, and it would be pleasing to me that you only eat meat in times of cold or famine. So in other words, when your crops won't grow and you're running out of food, then you can depend on, you know, butchering an animal as a source of food. But otherwise, God would prefer that you don't eat eat meat. That that uh, you we um, use and not abuse animals. So I brought this up to this person I was talking to, who loves to eat meat, and I brought it up in just a way. I said, you know, I wasn't calling them out specifically. Uh, we weren't actually talking about their habits or my habits or anything like that. But um, uh, the the Mormon temples are very different from just like the churches where we congregate. And in order to go and participate in the ordinances of the temple, you actually have to pass a two two interviews one with your the bishop who oversees your congregation and one a second one with uh somebody in it's called the stake presidency and they kind of oversee a group of congregations so in that temple recommend interview process you have to answer standard questions and one of those questions is do you obey the word of wisdom so the point I was making was, I felt like, like I was saying, like 99% of the Mormon population is lying when they say yes to obeying the word of wisdom. Not because they're drinking, smoking, or things like that, but because they're eating meat basically on a daily basis. Mm. They, they're, they're in the, the drive-thru at Chick-fil-A, you know none of these things am I calling evil. I'm not telling people they're, they're horrible because they do these things. But I am saying that if you are going to say, yes, I follow the word of wisdom and then you eat meat, 
on a very regular basis without any concern for how that animal was raised, butchered, et cetera, I think you're a liar. Yeah. I think you're lying to yourself and the person who's asking you that question. This person who, of course, like I said, loves to eat meat and hates to eat vegetables. (laughs) (laughs) was like, well, I don't think you're interpreting that correctly. I was like, I don't see how you can you can interpret it a different way. You know, and I was asking him things like what what does sparingly mean? What does only in times of cold or famine mean? I mean, how am I misinterpreting this, you know? <laughs> um, but, you know, to your point, you know, the more we talked about, the more they dug in, mm. the more, you know, they became just really like a, a really bad lawyer, you know, because they were like, what does, what does sparingly even mean? I was like, come on, dude. That's and then with the, the the one that really killed me was they said, well, you know, when it's hot, when it's really hot outside, I'm not even, you know, really in the mood to eat a lot of meat. And I just I, I doubled over laughing. So I was like, you think that's what God meant? You think God has like, well, check the thermostat, because if it's over 85, you probably <laughs> shouldn't eat meat. You know, I mean, it was so dumb and it was so incredibly <laughs> stupid and they were accusing me of being the one missing <laughs> I, I was just dying i was just dying <laughs> yeah so anyway I, you know those are the types of things where it's just it, it, it's so incredibly frustrating to try and participate in a religious community that is just lying to itself. Yeah. And it's that that is one of the most difficult things I have with participating in a Christian community, no matter what, you know, um, sect of Christianity we're talking about. I mean, I've explored, you know, lots. I, I, I don't, don't want to say most or all or anything, yeah. but I've done a lot of exploring of what different, you know, types of Christians believe and you know it, it's and I'm just talking about the institutions what they teach and I'm talking about how the general populace of those institutions interprets those things and I, I'm just like I'm sorry I just there's there's nothing out there for me there just really isn't <laughs> you know I, I mean I mean, I hate to sound egotistical, but but I'm too intelligent for it. <laughs> does, does that mean? I mean, does it? <laughs> but you know what I mean, though. I mean, no. Y- but you could you take this want... into a lot of areas in life. Yeah. You know, everyone's trying to interpret rules that give them favor, no matter what the arena is you're that you're in, and everyone wants to feel like this is the right thing for me. But the hypocrisy is. Too many people are not interested in killing their own hypocrisy for that. And just yeah. like I was watching this great series on Netflix, highly recommended called Eric with Benedict Cumberbatch. Truly amazing. I just saw that up there and I, I was Fine. thinking about checking it so out. So good. I mean, mm-hmm. you would love this big time. And but without giving it away, there's just a really good quote in the movie that resonated with me it's by Tolstoy, which is very, everyone's. Uh, everyone always wants to try to change the world, but very few people are interested in changing themselves. Mm. And I just was taken aback when Benedict Cumberbatch said this. And it's just between him and his son, they talk about this. And I said, that feels about right. Like everybody's trying to change all these things about society and, and let's do this and rail against this side and rail against that side. But very few people are interested in looking inward and going, maybe I need to work on myself. Maybe yeah. I'm part of the issue here. This is a fundamental flaw in humans. Fundamental from the beginning of time is this lack of giving two shits about actually expending the energy to look inward. And a lot of people say it. They say it. it it's very pop culture to say, I'm doing the work. I'm doing the self-care. I'm doing that. But real, But really, are you? But are you? Self-care, I feel like, especially when we, when you were talking about 
the stuff you see on maybe TikTok or Instagram or, or whatever, it's so surface. Yeah. Surface level self care. Yeah. Because for me, self care should make me less comfortable, not more comfortable. Does that yes. make sense? Yes, that is so true. That is so true, Simon. Self care should mean I'm putting myself out on the line. In other words, and if we're just talking about intellectually, I'm testing my ideas to see if they actually hold water. Yeah, That's uncomfortable to be honest with myself and say, maybe the stuff I believe isn't true. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and especially from a spiritual mindset when you've been raised in a, in a specific religion, perhaps, or, or if you converted to that religion, you're very excited about converting to that religion or, or what have you, to take this honest look inward and outward, because it's not just about, I, I, here's the other thing about self-care that I don't like, is that self-care in our popular culture is very selfish. Yeah. What if self care meant caring more about other people? Right. When we were talking about that word of wisdom, the Mormon health code, that was one of the points that I brought up. I said, you know, what if this whole thing about eating meat sparingly isn't about you or me? It's about how we treat our environment the world we've been given and these animals that we're consuming and that we're using for our benefit. What if it's about caring for them? Isn't that Jesus's whole message? Yeah, exactly <laughs> <You know? right. laughs> so I guess when I'm saying like my self care, the way I'm trying to approach my personal self care is how does my self care enable me to better care for others? Yes, most definitely. I actually just did, uh, I do a lot of lectures on self care, a very different point of view of it for different institutions and stuff. And my latest, um, let's say direction on this topic is related to self care as a gift to others. That's hmm. what it is about. And I'm a big firm believer that um, I love it when I say things you already know. And I know. You Stop already, telling yeah. me things I'm already doing. Yeah. It's just so <laughs> annoying. You know that. <laughs> like, but like, I like telling people, have ever thought about it? The fact that when you take care of yourself and you push yourself to make yourself look inward and all these things, that it creates confidence. Other people get confidence in you. So like, other people all of a sudden start thinking. This person really takes care of themselves. Like if something happened to me, I feel confident that they could help take care of me or that I could lean on them because they're really working on themselves. As much like, you know, let's think about you and Shannon or Michelle and I, like as we age and we get older, doesn't your partner want to have confidence in the fact that you're taking care of yourself so that if something happens with them, they have confidence Do you have the mental and physical and spiritual, whatever, aptitude to be good to them, to be there for them. Like, yeah. and I, then we don't think about it that way. We think about it selfishly that this is gonna, I'm gonna be a better meditator because of this. And I'm gonna be better at the food I eat. And me, 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 I'm gonna be so good. Instead of thinking, man, other people are gonna feel good about how I'm progressing as a human and that I can be there for them. They'll have confidence in me type of thing. And that's a different way of looking at it. Sometimes Shannon has felt like she's being overly selfish and not being a good mother because she is putting her own personal projects, maybe they're creative, maybe that you know, what, what, what have you her her ambitions could be writing poetry, all these other things. And those things take her away from her kids, you know, sometimes, you know, or more so, but what I have tried to convince her of over and over is that 
her being the woman she is, successful in the workplace, successful as an artist, a poet, a playwright, um, a performer, all these things. And she does spend time with her children. I, I, I don't want to paint that as if, you know, yeah, she's know. never around her sure. kids or anything. But but what I but the point I'm making is that she's showing her children how to live. She's setting the example and a standard that her children can look to and say, mom held down a full-time job and she wrote a one woman and performed a one woman show and she's uh editing right now to publish her first book of poetry you know you know these different things uh, you know on and on and on it's just it's show it it can and i understand the mindset that it it, it can communicate that those things might be more important to a person than their children you know, there's a balance there that needs to that needs to be. However, I think in in you know my wife's case, um, that's not what's happening. What's happening is that she's showing her children how to live a a very successful life, how to take care of the shit you have to take care of, and then also do the stuff that you want to do, that you desire to do as an artist or, or, or any other thing, you know, maybe you're a sports person or, you know, it doesn't, but, but that may, maybe I'm trying to say you can have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think like in one of the most powerful things you can do as a parent is show your children that you like to achieve things outside of their duties of being your, you know, your caretaker. For that, like seeing, like I always think growing up, I always loved seeing my dad was in the military for 28 years. I went to all of his promotions. I saw him do extraordinary things and the, if, you know, with his time in the military, I saw his achievement that inspired mm -hmm. me. I saw him as more than my father. I saw him as someone who wanted, who was inspiring other people and achieving and moving up in his preferred line of work. And I think sometimes it's easy for your children to typecast you in the movie. And you're that character. You're always going to be yep. Nick Cage or Tom Cruise in this movie. I don't care what role you play. You're Tom Cruise. You look you're yeah. just who you play. And parenting is a lot like that. You get typecast as um, so-and-so's, you know, parent. Mm -hmm. or, and you put it in the name of the book, in, in the uh, address book or your phone. Sophie's mom. You know, this and like they don't do anything else. They're just your mom or dad or something. You know, like and I think seeing your parent accomplish something was really important. It was why, like when I won trainer of the year, I had my daughter there in the front row in the L.A. Convention Center. I wanted her to see me in that moment mm -hmm. to see like you can do something big, too, mm -hmm. for that. But often, yeah. like we just typecast different people and we, we level it down. And there's nothing wrong with whatever. You know, being a parent is an incredible honor. It's a great achievement, actually, to do it well, especially. It's a great yeah. achievement because it's really hard to do it well. But I, that's something, at least my philosophy is, I want my child to know that I have other interests outside of just them and that I have a life that I'm pursuing that interests me, of that caters to my ambitions and dreams and goals. And I want you to see me doing that. I want you to know that, and I want you to pursue that. For them, don't typecast me. You know, yeah. <laughs> that you know. You know, going back to your your struggles with math, um, <laughs> how would it be to have a math teacher that you never saw answer you know a problem or, or 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 be able to work an equation? You know, so it's impossible sometimes as parents to really you know tell our children to go for it, to, to find their passion, to do these things. And then we're not. Yeah. I mean, what kind of message is that sending? You know? Right. So this morning when I got in the car to go to the gym, I turned the car on and uh, the previous child who had been driving the car uh, left the stereo blasting, which can be annoying, except 
they were playing one of my albums. That's right, baby. <laughs> Ever annoying. <laughs> so I crank it up even louder. <laughs> That's right. Hell yeah. <laughs> but that is the best compliment to me. That, like you're saying, I'm not just their father. I'm an artist, a musician in these things. And they don't just respect me because I'm their dad. Yeah. They genuinely you know appreciate the work that i do as an artist yeah. you know and and so anyway uh that, that that's just a beautiful wonderful feeling and and we've talked about it before it's not like my kids are you know asking me when my next album's going to drop cool. you know they're not they're not like wow. you know they're not feening for it man ain't no way <laughs> but but when i show them things they're like Man, that's really good yeah that's really good and you know i'm not uh you know i i i might i don't know if i'll ever be their favorite artist or whatever yeah, it's okay but yeah uh you know sometimes you're just too close to somebody close. to be their yeah. to be their you know favorite artist they're they're, they're you're just like well you know that's awesome, Dad. But I, I really like, I don't know. Yeah, whatever. I'm totally blanking on all the latest people yeah. that people like. But <laughs> don't worry, I've been blanking on that for a while. Don't. <laughs> it's so funny because you know I'm in that space where I make I make fun of people in my age group all the time who are still listening to the stuff we're listen we listen to as yeah. kids, and not that. It, that stuff's bad across the board, but I'm just saying like, especially like, you know, hair rock and stuff like yeah, that, yeah, you know, yeah. it's like, for me, that stuff's good for a giggle, you yeah. know, it's like, you know, putting on, you know, Def Leppard or something. Sure. It's good for like a nostalgic kind of giggle. It's like, yeah, this is what we used to listen to. You know, I thought this was rad when I was a kid, <laughs> rad. But, yeah. <laughs> but now, you know, I've grown up and was like, yeah, that stuff's really corny. <laughs> it's super corny and, and you know I, it's not that i am trying to disrespect those artists sure. and things like that uh um but i'm just saying that those things they're really stuck in that era yeah. for me yeah. they did not graduate from that era and and become timeless for me yeah yeah and so i make fun of all my friends who are still you know, like those are their favorite bands still. You know, I had a friend who just who just sent me some photos. They went to like this Kiss convention oh, concert, Kiss convention. and I'm just yeah, and I'm Jeez, just like, man. I'm just like Kiss has like one and a half good songs, maybe, maybe. I mean, that, that's being very generous yeah, that they have one and a half good that. songs, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you know, it's just it's it's so funny that that people are still nostalgic for that's the beauty bad, of life right bad yeah. music yeah bad music everyone has different flavors tastes but you know kind of like i want to get back to that because i have something i wanted to talk to you about with that but i also think about like with as a parent you're achieving stuff is to drive this point home bring by listen to this and maybe you're listening to this and you're very for some very controversial things but but think about your children if you have children or your parents and like think about if you they saw you going into that Capitol building and taking a shit on the floor, right? Or ransacking, destroying public property. Yeah. And you think, I'm just mm -hmm. doing this, you know, I, this is what I believe in. But somebody was watching you and your family do that. Maybe your son or your daughter was watching you do that. And you know what? Those chickens come home to roost later down the road, too. When they ask you, why did you do that? If they, if they think differently than you. Right. This is the thing we don't think about. We think we're changing the world by doing stuff like this, but we don't change ourselves and we don't see the butterfly effect of our behavior. And that many times that comes home down the line in the most brutal way inside your family, not out in the public, inside mm -hmm. your home like that. Like for, for a good example, and I'll finish it with this because I want to get that other thing. Some I think I may have mentioned this last time, but one of those guys from Jeff Sessions or one of these guys from Alabama who was a senator had mentioned that he lost his entire family because of his support yep. for Trump. And how deeply down the rabbit hole do you have to go where your children cut you off, 
because of your insane belief system and you're still into it. Like the worst thing you can do is give up your family for something, yeah. someone who literally doesn't care about you at all. I mean, that's the worst thing. No, no job is worth that. And, and I feel like so many of these folks who are loyal to Trump, yeah. they're loyal to Trump because they think their job's on the line. Yeah. As a senator or as a governor right. or whatever, yeah. they, they're going to get voted out because the MAGA base yeah. has such a loud voice. But, you know, and I'm not trying to say that those people don't believe, you know, sure. in Trump's message or things like that. They, they very well might. But if you look at the the overarching uh, 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 what's the word I'm looking for um, progression of the Republican Party. Yeah. If you just go from Reagan till now, unrecognizable. Yeah unrecognizable and not in a good way in a way that it has deteriorated to um, i mean it makes me think of charlton heston and the getting hosed down in planet of the apes it's a madhouse a madhouse <laughs> you know <laughs> you know yeah. so anyway it, it, that 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 makes me very sad having grown up you know conservative in a conservative yeah. household and things like that and Shannon and I were just reflecting on this the other day as well, where it's just like, you know, she grew up same way. And um, to look at the Republican Party today and, and, and look at what we grew up believing it was in the 80s, like I say, unrecognizable, yeah. unrecognizable. It's wild stuff, man. It's <clears throat> wild. So, you know, it's, I think it's a lesson in... Again, it's diff It's difficult tying it back if you don't have the processing power to really understand the things you're actually doing. And because if to think about the future, a lot of people talk about the future in sci-fi movies and conversations, whatever. But the, the hard part about the future is you can never understand the tsunami of impact that it will have based off of your decisions. Nobody thinks about the future based off of their decisions. They just think about cool shit they want to see in the future. Oh, this car is going to fly? What about the iPhone 20? Or are we going to have AI and stuff? They don't think about the future based off of their decision making. And that is that requires a higher level of processing, computing power to feel your decisions now and simultaneously predict it into the future and go, how would I feel if I kept this and my children didn't like me anymore? You have to um, have a whole nother feeling, a level yeah. of computing to have that conversation. You know, This past Sunday, I took a walk with a friend and we, we got on these types of, of topics just a little bit. And uh, one thing that I was telling them that I would rather vote for somebody who I disagree with yeah. on, on political topics and everything, who is noble. Yeah. So, you know, I would just say, like, well, let's just say Mitt Romney runs for president again. Sure. He's not going to, but I truly believe he's a noble yeah. human being. I don't agree with all of his politics, sure. you know, but he does come from kind of more of a Reagan-esque, you know, Republicanism that, that I recognize, you know. And... Uh, and, and that nobility and, 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 and like I say, maybe policy wise, we don't agree, yeah. but you're a noble person. Yeah. And my question to all those who are MAGA supporters, mm -hmm. are you voting for a noble person? Whether or not you agree with all the policy, are you voting for a noble person? Are you putting a noble person in office? in the in the most powerful office in the world yeah so for me i'm just like you know once again i don't agree with everything biden does and says and, and everything like that but i think he's a noble person of course by and large he's not a perfect person but a noble person and and, and like anybody people in his family have problems of course 
you know, I no mean, doubt. his son yeah. is definitely guilty, man. I'm telling you, uh, yeah, I, I, coming I know. up with this it's trial, like, the gun trial, yeah. like, man, the evidence is overwhelming to me. Yeah. I could be wrong, but you know, exactly. And and has he maybe tried to protect his son? Maybe he has, maybe. but that's his son. Yeah, that's his son. Yeah, you would I would protect. I would protect yeah. my son too. I would do whatever it took to try and keep my son out of prison as well. Yeah. So I'm I'm just saying, yeah, not perfect, but noble and yeah. at some point i i this is just an open-ended question will maga supporters ever look back and recognize that this was a big mistake that like you said had butterfly effects changed their party for the worse yeah big time for the worse changed the culture of the republican party for the worse and they, the voters, are the ones who did it. Yeah. I'm going to answer that question. I know it's open-ended. I would like to answer that question. And yes, I'm going to say the people who are have higher computing processing power but make the other decision, they will say, yes, it was a mistake once it stops benefiting them over time. Mm. The other side of the coin does not have the processing power to do that. In my opinion, I could be very wrong. I just think mm -hmm. it's just not there. And I actually feel the the people who are, if you say, well, what's the worst side of this? Definitely the people who are who know better. To me, that's the worst side. The yeah. other folks, it's just an innate aspect of like, what are you going to do? I mean, you, if you can't actually see over the horizon or if you can't actually think about what would be on the other side of a mountain, theoretically versus, you know, like, like if you can, if you can't, let's say you and I can have a conversation about quantum mechanics, superposition, quantum entanglement, qubits, and the theoretics behind that. If you go, well, I, I can't even like, no, that doesn't exist. I can't talk to you about something that doesn't exist. Okay. Then you're probably never going to think that was a bad decision probably for some, whatever, and just take it to anything. Yeah. It doesn't have to be that high level. It could be talking about how, the inner workings of your healthcare system and deductibles and co-pays. And all, I mean, literally stuff that comes yeah. on in life. If they can't, you can't understand that. If you can't process that. You're probably going to think, well, it is what it is. I made the decision and this is what happened to our country and you're just not going to do it. You know? So to me, I've, I've really come down to these two things. Maybe there's some nuance in the middle of it. Could be. Uh, but I'm, I just, when it stops, ben when something stops benefiting people, then they usually see the light only because it stops benefiting them at that yeah. point. And as much <clears throat> like kind of turning when we were talking about, um, music and stuff, one of the things I'm so like, I get so worked up is about is this obsession with celebrity. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's this quote, like, yeah, be careful of meeting your heroes, you know, or people you... Because often they're not what they're portraying, you know. Like yeah. and this isn't a bad <clears> thing I'm about to say, but I watched the John Bo John Bon Jovi documentary on Hulu, like a month ago. I was very disappointed in what I saw, because mm -hmm. John Bon Jovi, well, I mean, seems like a really nice guy. He seems like one of the more neurotic, obsessive, weird people I've ever seen on TV. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want to know this person. Okay, just do the music. I'm like, like, That's funny. <laughs> That's my really wife funny. was like, he's like a worry wart. Like he can't, he can't relax. All he does is he's like, he's a strange dude. I was like, yeah, but that's what happens when you go inside the life of someone. It's usually never what you think it is. A lot of times these guys and a lot of people are just cosplaying the person they think you want them to be. Mm -hmm. I'm not into that. man. Yeah. Uh, there's a part of me that, that <clears throat> is very sympathetic to somebody like that because yeah. of the machine that they have That's to true. become a part of. That's true. The pressure to have another hit, the pressure yeah. to, you know, have ticket sales and all these things. It's not just your livelihood that's on the line. It's a lot of people's livelihoods that are that, that's on the line. So there's a part of me that's sympathetic to that. But but I understand what you're saying. If, you, yeah. if you're just looking at it from an artistic perspective, then I think the the artists who who make the biggest waves, they're not trying to write the next top ten hit. 
No. They're trying to they're trying to do something that's interesting. Yeah. They're trying to do something that pushes their capabilities and the capabilities of the medium to the next level. And you know, that's where we get our Picassos, our Michelangelos, right. our, you know, all, all these, you know, different kinds of artists. That's that's where we get the Beatles and George Martin who are just like pushing the boundaries of the science of recording. You know, they're just trying stuff. Yeah. Oh, may, may, maybe it's not going to sound good. I mean, honestly, there's there's moments in Beatles tracks where I'm like, it doesn't really sound good, but it sounds really interesting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> That's where I think the Beach Boys have always outclassed the Beatles is where mm. it's just like the Beach Boys albums always sound amazing. Right. And honestly, there's 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 some tracks in the Beatles where I'm just like, yeah. Sounds interesting, but it doesn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the Beach Boys managed to do both. Right. Be interesting and gorgeous every track. That's true. Just gorgeous. Yeah. No, it's true. It's I think that like you made you made a really good point about that, Bon Jovi. I hadn't thought about it that way. And I thought, you know, that I gotta retool that a little bit. But on the same vein, I think when you get close to like really get close to something. And I think this is the good and bad of all of our technologies. Maybe the, the thing in the past is you could see someone performing and not really know anything about them and just keep them in that, that picture frame and, and keep mm -hmm. them in the light you want to keep them in. But now if your artist is always doing podcast interviews and is doing their own podcast and then giving you their opinion about politics, religion, whatever it is, all of a sudden that person becomes like someone from your town mm, that you may yeah. or may not like anymore. And sometimes I want to crystallize that. Per like, honestly, this, this annoyed me so much. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. This is like really annoyed me. Like Terrence Howard, who's, uh, I really enjoy his acting and Empire and different like um, movies with um, Morris Chestnut and stuff. He's just a great actor. You know, he recently went on Joe Rogan and was like a psycho. I mean, it was just like the stuff he was saying was so outlandish. And I said, I told my wife, I said, I just wish I didn't know this about him. I honestly yeah. didn't know. <clears throat> I wanted to just keep him in this picture of in these movies. But that's the point. If you start to get to know people, you may realize they're not who you thought they were. I was like, oh, I would spend no time with him. I don't need to be around crazy people. <laughs> like, like, <laughs> you know, what's interesting is that even on screen, I got that vibe from him. Yeah, right? Like little nutty. Like, <laughs> like, like, I just got the vibe that he's kind of in his own headspace and he yeah. thinks he's better. But yeah. I actually haven't listened to the Joe Rogan thing. Yeah. I saw the little headline things, yeah. you know, Terrence Howard, you know, this or whatever. Honestly, he's not somebody I'm that interested in, so I didn't click on anything. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm just being honest with you. It's like, I, I'm, 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 I just don't even care. You yeah. know, Terrence Howard, he, he's not in my top 10 of anything. Um, yeah. I, I, I think he's, he's a good actor. I'm not, I'm not knocking him on that. Sure. Yeah. I'm saying that, that, you know, his work hasn't interested me enough yeah. to where I, I actually care about what he says about anything, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, and I, I liked him in Best Man in the Wood and all these kind of like really, um, you know, celebration of black uh, actors type of yeah. shows. I really mm -hmm. I really like that. I resonate with that. But I was just like, man, and I don't even I don't even listen to Joe Rogan. I think he's crazy, honestly, uh, but I really do. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> have a, a I don't have any real respect for Joe Rogan. Either. Yeah, I, mean, I just think he's one of these yeah. people who, like he may know better, but he's choosing weird stuff for for gain. And stuff. Yeah. I just think that I find despicable, but I understand the human aspect of that. But you know, it's hard, just hard. Like when you 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 you're like, oh, I like your work, and then you mm -hmm. learn about the personal nature, and I'm like, ah, God, I wish I didn't know about this part of you. <laughs> it's yeah. just like I just really wish I didn't know. Like I don't know. And I think sometimes there's uh, when you get to know someone a lot, you start getting inside the how the sausage is made a quote you know whatever maybe yeah. how maybe i don't know i don't need sausage and all that stuff <laughs> but like whatever the alternative plant-based thing is whatever <laughs> grown yeah. however it's grown <laughs> like, yeah i just like i'm very like sensitive to that because i 
I just I sometimes I'm like, man, why did this happen? <laughs> like, yeah. No, it, it it is nice. You know, it, it's great when you have somebody maybe like a Denzel Washington. Yeah. It was just, you know, it, it, you know, just an amazing actor. Everything he does, yeah. he's amazing. Even if the movie sucks, he's amazing. Totally true. Yeah. He elevates everything he's he's a part of. And he seems to do that in just like his daily life <laughs> as well. He, he yeah. seems to just elevate the conversation at any time, yeah. you know, and he's not somebody that I always agree with. Maybe, uh, um, you know, he's a very devout uh, Christian and things like that. We, we might disagree on a lot of um, of our ideas of, of what that means in religion and, sure. and things like sure. that and, and how to express ourselves and, and things like that. Doesn't matter to me at all. Don't care about that at all because I don't care if I disagree with somebody once again. I care if they're noble. Yes. And Denzel Washington to me is one of those people who just, he's he's, retained his nobility he's retained no matter how nobility. successful he's become yes that's the key that's it this is where i think elon musk has made a huge mistake in his life is that he went from talking about colonizing mars spacex tesla and then started to veer into all these cultural personal things i don't really care what he thinks about though i just just make a good car like get you do make a good product and i think sometimes like when you become a certain level of fame, you think everybody's interested in everything that you talk about. Like, yeah. And I was like, no, no, I wouldn't come to you for advice about any relationship in my life. In fact, you're really bad at that. But I don't know anything about electric cars. So yeah, I, I'm gonna listen to that. But it's just like this ego of like, I'm good at this. So you know what? I should be good at discussing these other things too, you know? <laughs> You know, it's just like a lot of ego with that type of mentality. yeah. You know, um, one of the things this person that I talked to this past Sunday um, uh, on that three-hour phone conversation, uh, they are were very adamant about if the if a prophet of God says it doesn't doesn't matter what any evidence to the contrary, and you know what it doesn't matter. They they just follow what the prophet says yeah and you know my simple question was of course but what about when they're wrong and they were just adamant about when they are speaking as a prophet they're never wrong and i was like well, oh, what just... about warren jeffs i mean all these people yeah. <laughs> like, like... yeah and you know they were they don't believe warren jeffs is a prophet you know uh but specifically i guess if you just look at the bible let's just let's only deal with prophets sure. in the bible the bulk of the Hebrew Bible, or what Christians call the Old Testament, is so often about prophets who are wrong. They have a very complicated relationship with God. They make bad decisions. Uh, let's just take the story of Jonah. Jonah and the whale and everything, you know, he's sent to Nineveh. He doesn't want to go. He disobeys God, goes, and he's like, and going in the opposite direction, you know, blah, blah, blah. He's doing, he's just doing everything wrong, even though God is talking to him, telling him what to do. And then when he's successful in his teaching to the people of Nineveh and they repent and God doesn't destroy the city of Nineveh, he's disappointed. You know, I mean, yeah, of course. He, he's, he, these people are human beings. Of course. And I think that get, gets lost all the time. With, with this person I was talking to, I use the, the um, example of Paul. Yeah. Most Protestant churches, they 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 follow Paul. We've we've had this discussion yeah. before. They're 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 they are Pauline churches. <laughs> well, Paul's wrong all the time. All the time, contradicting. I mean, it's unbelievable. Yeah, I mean, there, there's there's not only anachronisms in Paul's yeah. you know writings, which is what how a lot of scholars determine. Well, this yeah. wasn't actually Paul who wrote it. You know, this was written later. It was attributed to Paul. But even in the ones where it is assumed that Paul is the author, and I used a very, uh, you know, I was like, you know, I, I don't want to nitpick. So I don't want to use like an anachronism or something because that's just, that, that could be nitpicking. So I, I went for the, the big thing, you know, Paul thought that he was going to see Jesus's second coming. That's right. And he thought he was not going to taste death 
but would be, in his own words, be changed in the twinkling of an eye from imperfect to per imperfection to perfection. So he thought he was going to be resurrected without ever dying. And the joke I always make is, boy, that must have been really awkward for him when he's getting his head chopped off. You know, <laughs> I mean, it's just... this must have been really awkward. <laughs> it's like, whoops. Really? Yeah. You're like, what's a... going on here? <laughs> but that's a big oopsie daisy. And he's yeah. writing that as God's representative. Yeah. He is, you know, and, and this is canonized in our Bible. Yes. And, 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 and in, in what most Protestant, you know, churches believe is the inerrant word of God. And here's Paul. I mean, we're 2000 years later, still no second coming. I mean, Paul was really off on his calculations. <laughs> you know, he's just, I mean, that is a uh, huge major misstep in your <laughs> scheduling, you know? Yeah. So, uh, you know, I just bring that up. So I just say, so what, what about when they're wrong? And in this case, you can say Paul was kind of like a Warren Jeffs or, or one of these. Yeah, or the Heaven's Gate guys. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, you know, because they are preaching God is coming back now. Yeah. You know, it might be today, it might be tomorrow. Jesus is returning now. Get ready for it. 2,000 years later, hasn't happened. Yeah. And this person I'm talking to, they're like, well, I'm, you know, they're like, well, I'm not w worried about myself and, 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 and Jesus is second coming right now and, and all this and all the bad things are going to happen. But I'm worried about my grandkids. It's like, come on, people Matt. have been talking this way for 2000 years and it still hasn't happened. Get over it. <laughs> I, mean, I want to be worried Get... about climate change, bro. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> there are... <laughs> there, there are so many things more pertinent and 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 time sensitive and, and all these things. I mean, the last thing anybody should be worried about is Jesus's second coming because it hasn't happened for two thousand years. Uh, it, you know, if it happens at all, it might not happen for another two thousand years. Just yeah. stop talking about it and live yeah. a good life. Live, live a, good a good life. life. Live a good life. There are other more pressing things that are literally happening underneath your feet right now that yeah. will affect your grandchildren literally will affect your grandchildren yeah you know? the last thing you need Come to worry on, about man. is the book of revelations happening <laughs> for your grandchildren i mean uh, and once again the book of revelations was written as if it's happening yeah. you know next week next month yeah of course you yeah. know it literally says in the opening chapters of the book of revelation that those who crucified jesus would see him come again right they would be here for the second coming. So, I mean, the, 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 since the dawn of Christianity, these types of apocalyptic preaching yeah. have been so wrong. Yeah. Stop believing them. Just stop. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care if it's Paul or John or whoever said it. They're so wrong. Stop <laughs> believing it. My pastor actually did a sermon on this one time. It was hilarious. <laughs> And he was talking literally about that. He was like, you just, these are just foolish things that people do. Like, it was funny. He was talking about it. He was like, yeah. you know, he, he said, you can cite so many different groups have said this. And he's like, it's just ridiculous, honestly, to be thinking this way. But it's a way of, um, I do understand why people do it, is it's a way to have power over other people and to create yeah. a buy-in. You know, you got to have a hook. For some, everything has a hook, man. It's like, it's this product will do this. You know what? You have bad skin. Yeah. You know what we're going to do this. And then the behind the thing, they're like, this is bullshit. This doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this guy has I mean, massive what... amounts of acne. It's like, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> but you need it, though. You need that. <laughs> well, when you think about why Christianity took off the way it, it did under teachings of people like Paul. It's yeah. because it was a doomsday cult. Yeah. There's a lot of that still. I mean, you know, there's yeah, actually I mean, a lot of that still. I mean, Paul on. and John and those guys, they were preaching a doomsday cult. Yeah. You know, and and very convinced like every doomsday cult that it's happening now. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> it's happening now. And now they're pimping it in a different way and like online cults, like the Sherry Shriner cult and all this stuff. It's just different forms of a hustle for that. Yeah. That gets further and further away from the 
uh, really beautiful teachings of Jesus just keeps getting further from that. And it's like apexing with uh, white Christian nationalism. And they're like peacocking hard with it. And it's like so opposite of what, like the same thing you didn't recognize about conservatism. I don't recognize fundamentalism as anything like what Jesus is talking about. I don't even know what that is. That's like two different yeah. things. I and mean, in their mind, though, it's very similar. It's the same thing. Yeah. But they can't see it, though. And some of that's some processing power. Too. <laughs> they can't, you can't see stuff that you actually can't see. <laughs> you know, like, Isn't that interesting? You know, um, uh, I always hesitate to tell these little anecdotes because I never want to set things up as like, oh, I see something other people don't see. Yeah. It's like, no. Well, I mean, that might be true. Yeah. But that is to also make the assumption that other people see things that I don't see. Sure. Here's a good example of that, that the um, New Orleans Art Museum that we were we were in and, and Shannon saw the whole museum. Yeah. I might have seen half, maybe, because I just got stuck on certain paintings. One in particular, like I said, I probably spent like a half hour staring at that painting. And and not just like from a distance, like taking my glasses off because I'm very nearsighted and getting like inches away from the canvas so I could see the most minute detail possible. Because I was just awestruck by the masterwork of it. I was seeing things most people who will just walk by and not notice. Yeah. But the people who walked by and didn't notice the things that I saw they saw more of the museum than I did. That's true. So you pick your poison sometimes, I guess, you know, um, yeah. and, 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 and so, but probably what I was doing was more akin to fanaticism. Mm. The only difference was I didn't believe that this painting had any power. <laughs> you know, what, you know what I mean. Yeah, I'm like, like, what I wasn't, were the stakes for it? Like you yeah, staring at a painting. Exactly. It wasn't like it cost yeah. you an election, or exactly. it cost you yeah. like some negative thing. Like yeah. that's the thing. Yeah, and, sometimes the things you can't see and you're blind to have really bad consequences to it. You know. Yeah. So I I, I like my version of fanaticism personally it works for me my version of fanaticism is to look extremely deeply at things have them change me for the better yeah but it is not a religion that i'm preaching to everybody else yeah. that everybody else has to think and feel the same way that i do yeah also in new orleans we went to this indian restaurant oh my gosh man it was so good awesome. oh the, the food was so amazing but when we first got in there Shannon and our friend that we were traveling with, uh, Eddie, they immediately sat down at the table that the waiter showed us to. But I noticed all the this amazing photography on the walls. And they were all, it was all photography of uh, India people, a lot of portrait photography of these beautiful Indian people, you know, of all types, not just like traditionally beautiful, but sometimes, you know, dirty, you know, beautiful, that kind of rugged pastoral yeah. beauty. As I'm walking and I'm appreciating the, the amazing photography along the walls, I get to this one photo in particular. And I just start crying. Yeah, I'm looking at this photo and I just I mean, it's embarrassing. <laughs> I'm in a restaurant looking at a photo on the wall and I just yeah. start crying because it's so beautiful to me. And it's just a photo of a shepherd leading his sheep down a narrow street. And this, he has his like cane and his arms raised and he's holding his cane and he has this wonderful smile on his face as, as he's like, hello, take my picture kind of a thing. And I just thought he was the most beautiful person in the world at that moment. And that that scene was the most beautiful scene I'd ever seen. And I'm just wiping away tears and I'm just like, come on, Eli, get control of yourself, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're just here for the food. 
he had an experience. <laughs> like... But those are the things, you know, if I show that photo to somebody, I took a photo of the photo yeah. with my phone. If I show that to somebody, they're not going to have the same experience, not at all. Yeah. And I'm not going to expect them to. Right. And I think that is where my version of fanaticism versus the institutionalized religious version of fanaticism differ, where I'm here having my experience and I don't expect my experience to be anybody else's. Yeah. But the religious institution fanaticism tells you that if you're not having this experience, you're wrong right? and you're in danger of going to hell. Yeah, it's a threatening experience. There's a th there's always a threat. Um, the authors like Sarah McCammon and Kristen Kobes, I'm, I'm hacking this up, Dumez. Sorry, Kristen, I don't, you're not going to listen to this probably, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you know who you are. But they talk about how this fundamentalist based fanatical version of Christianity is all about threats. It's all about threats. Mm -hmm. It's all about there has to be a threat to your soul, a threat to your existence. And if you don't follow these things, then you are in danger. There is danger, Will Robinson. We're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. And a true kindness, true love doesn't put threats on people. It doesn't threaten who you are. It, it works with you and helps you and is kind with you. And is peaceful with you, man. That sounds a lot like Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> it sure like, does. Mm. <laughs> <it's> like, <laughs> where where people ask him who yeah. he is, and he and he just says, "Come and see." He doesn't say he doesn't say, "Follow me or else." <laughs> right. It's just an invitation. Come and see. Come and see. Yeah, you it's know. a it's a beautiful way of knowing someone. It's an explore exploration of knowing love. And kindness, I'm just really interested in that. You know, I'm just like, and so when I don't see, when I see someone telling me they're into that, but then their behavior is the opposite, I'm just like, well, you're not interested in killing the hypocrisy in this. You're just, and yeah. again, I think maybe, let me, let me step back and think about this because everything, everybody uses the word brainwashing. They're brainwashed. They're brainwashed. And my thing is, yes, that does happen. But I'm going to go back to the beginning. But what if it's their brainwash because they just before the brainwashing happened, they just didn't have the brain power <laughs> so like like it's kind of like we always think, well, people don't exercise because they don't have any willpower. But we never think about it because biologically speaking, humans are conservation machines. Mm. We don't do things a lot because the path of least resistance is heavily built into our thousands and thousands and thousands of years of biology, we do things to stay alive and to conserve energy, not always because I just don't feel like it today. And, and, and maybe the, the basics may be, the, mo may be the, the greatest answer to most things, the basics. Our body is always searching for its homeostasis, That's right. right? You know, and, and, and um, it adapts its particular homeostasis to our habits. Yes. So one person's bodily homeostasis might be to be extremely overweight and unhealthy, but the body has set a new baseline for what it's comfortable with. And now it becomes very uncomfortable to leave that homeostasis. And, and, and we've had this conversation very recently and you were tell, talking about how you didn't feel good when you changed to yes. vegetarianism. Yes. It's uncomfortable. The body starts to reject it, you know, because it, we're leaving homeostasis now. Yeah. And that discomfort makes us, as we talked about before, it makes us reject change. Yes. Well said. I mean, it's it's the uh, basis for the inverted U hypothesis in sports performance. You teach an athlete a new skill after doing something the opposite way, and their performance decreases initially because it's new. Mm -hmm. I mean, you suck at everything you're new at. Generally, you're like, of course, newsflash. No one likes being bad at new stuff. I get it. And then your <laughs> performance goes down, and then as you practice and you get better and you overcome that hump. Me, those two weeks when my mouth felt really strange, 
<laughs> and like <laughs> my body felt awkward. And then mm. I started going up to you again. I started feeling really good. Then I felt better than before. Like, yeah. It's that part at the bottom of the you that we don't want to go through. We don't want that part. We just want the high highs, man. My youngest son is is going through this right now with basketball. And I have been trying to help him change his shooting form. Because, you know, like most young people, you know, he just had this terrible shooting form. He's like shooting from the bottom of his chest, you know, and just, sh you know, and, and, and this is what I, you know, constantly talk to him about all the time. It's like, we're not shooting the ball at the hoop. Yeah. We are shooting the ball up and through, yeah. you know, and, and that's the difference between that shooting form that you have when you're, you know, young and you're just, you're just trying to get the ball up there. Just trying you know? to get it there. Yeah. Yeah. Versus now that he's, he's 14. He's more athletic. He's stronger now. We can really uh, shift to a proper uh, shooting form, yeah. and he's seeing it. You know, he's been struggling for weeks with it, but now he's starting to come out the other side, yeah. where it's not perfect, but it's getting so much better. Yeah, so much better. And now it's going to start becoming more natural, and pretty soon he's 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 going to be a better shot than i am you know <laughs> yeah you got to put in the reps right i mean you have yeah to, exactly and you have and to and suck i'm not and he is <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? you're gonna suck so you know it's like just part of it man it's like this that acceptance of not doing well is hard for people to take they reject it they're like nope I should be better at this pretty quickly i'm like in what planet does that happen yeah <laughs> like there's a favorite moment of mine. Did you ever watch the movie Young Sherlock Holmes? Yeah, yeah. I, I on many levels, I still love that movie. <laughs> I I think one of the most spectacular use of special effects I've ever seen is when the stained glass knight yeah comes out of the window. I think that looks better than most any special effects I've uh, that I've seen today. It, I I think it, you know he. he, he you know, you can sit there and argue, well, it doesn't look real or, or whatever. It's, like, it's not supposed to. It's a stained glass yeah. window night. Anyway, I think it's spectacular. But there's this one moment in that movie where, uh, uh, you know, the, the Watson has just come to the to the school and he's going to be um, uh, rooming right next to Sherlock Holmes. And Sherlock is struggling on the violin. And he, Sherlock goes to just smash the violin. He holds it up above his head. And he's going to smash it. And Watson is like, no, no, no. And uh, Sherlock just voices his frustration. He says, I should have mastered the damn thing by now. And Watson asks him, how long have you been playing? He says, two weeks. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> how dare you be yeah. less time. More time I mean. But, you know, we have that impatience within us. Even those of us yeah. who aren't the the amazing, you know, uh, Sherlock Holmes, yeah. uh, we, we have that within us where we're so impatient to be able to master something. Yeah. And uh, without understanding that those who have mastered something have been doing it, you know, 10, 20 years, yeah. you know, ne until they finally mastered something. And it just requires that kind of dedication. An Olympic athlete, doesn't train for two weeks. <laughs> no. <laughs> you <know? laughs> no, you're seeing the finished product, man, out yeah. there, you know? And it's like, oh man, these guys are these guys, girls, they're amazing. I'm like, yeah, but you don't see the unglamorous nature of this, the tremendous amount of pain, suffering, getting beat up, the practices that nobody watches, and just the time alone getting better. I mean, it is a it's it's what most of us don't want to do because it is a desertion of homeostasis. You, yeah. If you if you are really going to become masterful at anything, you have to desert any kind of comfort, any kind of uh, balance in your life. You you throw out the window to become masterful at this thing, and yeah. most of us don't want to do that because we want to have just uh, a normal balanced life where we just enjoy ourselves we feel comfortable in what we're doing we, we're just enjoying the food we eat instead yeah. of instead of eating for performance you yeah. know or yeah. you know what whatever it is you know this sounds like the 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 uh premise to batman begins simon <laughs> he's like you'd have to go a thousand does, right? miles for anyone to not know who you were bruce and he goes and does his whole thing you know it's like 
I just rewatched that again, actually. I was like, oh, I want to watch that again. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's it's a good one, man. And and it, that's a really good parallel because he he spends I don't think do they ever say how long he's gone doing it? Seven I, years. I don't remember. Seven, Seven years. years. Yeah. It's a long time, man. Yeah. So for se- and I think that's a pretty I mean, obviously, Batman is not a realistic thing, yeah, but sure. yeah. it's a realistic idea to think if somebody is going to go out and try to understand the, the criminal yeah. mind and the underworkings of the you know criminal society yeah. or whatever you want to call it, yeah. and be able to acquire elite fighting skills, yeah. you know, things like that, to be able to dedicate yourself for that extended period of time yeah. and... And with that singular focus and boy, how uncomfortable must he have been for seven years? Yeah. You know, <laughs> because it's a long time, man, to do something, you know, and, and it starts out, if I'm not mistaken, if I remember correctly, it's been a while, but he starts his journey by first giving away his fancy coat, right? To the homeless guy. Yep. And he throws his wallet into the burning can, you know, and, and he starts running. He starts running. Yeah. And, and, and it's this beautiful symbolic moment of giving up every comfort creature comfort that I have. And now I'm going to live the most uncomfortable way possible so that I can become something different. I can become something different, right? It's like this breaking down of this person you were to become this different person, you know, to, come back and and become bad man <laughs> <In this sense. laughs> i mean we're all trying to become yeah, bad right? aren't we i mean <laughs> yeah it's kind of the goal i think for most <laughs> of us to become, us, you know, to become the batman of whatever it is we want yeah, everyone's trying to become the batman yeah. of something you know it's yeah like, exactly raz al ghul and then you go yeah. there and you become you must be and i think like this is actually i never thought about this way and even like liam neeson before he started doing all those weird taken uh show the uh, movies yeah. When he's like, you know, you have to become more than a man. You have to become an idea to people. Mm. I just love those parts, you know. Yeah. Like you have to be able to disappear and like, like you you have to become bigger than this than a person. People have to like fear. They're gonna the fear of the idea of you, and what you and that's the whole symbol, the bat symbol. It's it's a you know and the and the Batman with Robert Pattinson in the beginning. He goes, this is how they contact me, but it's also a warning. It's a warning. Yeah. Also. That's a different way of looking at it too, that they did. It's a warning. Like it's I'm, a warning I'm coming. I'm out here. I'm, yeah. I'm out here. Watch your back. You know, like. That is a perfect parallel to everything we've been talking about <laughs> because um, to what you were saying earlier, uh, Bruce Wayne, he wants to change the world. Yeah. But in order to do that, he spends seven years changing himself. himself. Yeah. So we have the seven years of preparation of changing oneself before the attempt is ever made to make any change to the world around him. Right. Man, we're we're geniuses, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> that was just a joke. It wasn't. <laughs> that was like a perfect like wrap around like right like it he was it was wants to do something he's got all these feelings these emotions his parents passed away i'm gonna take i'm gonna put a he puts a gun into his trench coat and he's think he's gonna go there and kill mr chill and he thinks that's gonna change everything no way it's bigger than that and then at that point he realizes i have to change myself first with mm-hmm. the aid of you know his friend um I forgot what her name is in real life. Jeez, uh, Tom Cruise's old flame. Anyway, she was in that that first yeah. one, and she really makes some question. The, his the only real mistake of that movie was her being cast. And I'm not trying know, to hate I on her. Yeah. I'm just saying Katie Holmes. That's what. It, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just saying it's it was a really good choice to recast that role. Yeah, that, yeah that's all I'm saying. Maggie Gyllenhaal, I think, in the yeah. second one. But like, you know, he realized like this vengeance that I have. I have to work on this. I have to work on letting this go. But when I do that, I have to change myself. And yeah. that's what that's what's missing. And all of these 
large institutional conversations, whether it's politics, religion, whether it's vaccination, whether it's fanaticism about sports, whatever it is, is you have to be willing to look inside to make a real difference. Whatever somebody's batting average is or free throw percentage or their platform is or whatever it is, it really comes down to you. <laughs> like You're being controlled by this other thing, but you're not willing to do anything to take control of yourself for that. Yeah. Right. This just controlling it, people. Yeah. All these things yeah. are controlling people without people taking power back uh, for themselves, you know. I mean, isn't that the classic despot, you know, who uh is trying to control other people but has no control over themselves? <laughs> yeah. Right. You know, they don't classic. have control over their their own emotions and their 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 ability to handle their fear and their anger yeah. and all these kinds of things, but they are determined to control other people. Yeah. And once again, if we take that back to our own uh, religious upbringing, that that, that is the opposite of Jesus, who is um, not attempting to control people, especially not via fear, anger, all these other things. But he is attempting to show an example of love, kindness and charity, which he is trying to teach everybody. This is what the law of Moses was trying to teach you all this time. Mm. Um, but the spirit of the law got, got lost. Just like that word of wisdom thing. There was like, what, you know, the spirit of the law uh, of that law is health. And the person that I was talking to on the phone is not a healthy person. Yeah. And in fact, they had to admit that they are eating less meat because they had had heart attack triple bypass surgery, all this stuff. Yeah. And I actually, you know, I must have annoyed the hell out of them because I was like, <laughs> wait a minute, could, could, could you repeat that again, please? Was, you know, <laughs> they were just like, yeah, I'm eating less meat for, for help. I was like, oh, so you're saying that if you actually followed the word of wisdom, you would have been healthier all this time? Oh. You know, that's, <laughs> that hurt. that's a deep cut, though. That's a deep cut. To, to yeah. you know, like that's it is. I mean, it's difficult for thing. all of us because yeah. I mean, I go through the same thing. I love right. junk food. I love it. And as post 35, junk food puts weight on, you know, pre age 35. Yeah. Didn't have to worry about it. Never an issue. Yeah. And now, especially at 46, I'm constantly thinking about that balance of food I can't enjoy versus food for fuel. Right. And how can I make the food for fuel food that I do enjoy, you know, and right. all these kind of things. But it, it is that thing. So we all have our, our thing. And, I, and that's why I'm trying to always say, I'm not trying to say everybody should be like me because I eat too many Doritos. I eat too much <laughs> uh, black licorice. I love black licorice. You know, uh, I could eat it every day. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that you about know, you. <laughs> yeah, just just those kinds of things. Yeah. It's like we all have our things that we're 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 working on, you know, personally and, and things like that. So I'm not gonna sit here and say, Oh, you shouldn't eat that meat. And then I turn around and eat my bag of Doritos and and a bag of black licorice. You know, I mean that yeah. would be just yeah. you know really stupid of me to do. But I can say, uh, you know, I I I can say maybe we can look more into especially if it's something you claim to believe and you claim yeah. to follow. And I think that is one of the big things. Uh, I, I've talked to you about this before, but you know, uh, something like 15 years ago, I kind of made a promise to myself that I was going to start eradicating hip hypocrisy from my own mm -hmm. life. Yeah. And sometimes eradicating hypocrisy doesn't even mean changing what you're doing. It means ex it means just accepting that what I'm doing is bad for me. It's bad, yeah. It, it's, right. What like I'm doing it. is wrong, yeah. but I'm still doing it. Yeah, and I know and, I'm and, doing it. Yeah. yeah, and that's the first step, I think, in, in being able to eradicate hypocrisy from one's own self. Yes. You know, the next step, of course, is to actually change. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the really hard part. Yeah. <laughs> like, all right, maybe we're not geniuses. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but that is that first step and, and 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 that is such a disconnect in the first step where where most of us are just lying to ourselves constantly 
about the things that we need to change in our own lives. Or, or maybe I shouldn't even say need to. Nobody needs to. Live your own life. Do whatever the yeah, hell you that's want. That's true. Yeah. But if you are looking to become this better version of oneself, then change is required and change doesn't happen until we're honest. Yeah, most definitely. Man, this always is such a good thing, Simon. Seriously. I mean, yeah. it seems like you're you're having a lot of these different types of conversation with people. And I do too, but not on this level with people. This is where yeah. I come to get the real hardcore deep stuff, man. Like <laughs> seriously. It's, it's tough. I, and I will say like, I have very few of these conversations. With I want to have them like, yeah. and I was actually laughing about this with somebody recently. I said, me being my best self tends to annoy the hell out of people. Yeah. Because I want to have this kind of conversation that you and I are having and most people just don't. Yeah. It requires a lot of computing power. I'm telling you, like, it, it's just not even like just intelligence, just like energy wise, like you get over energy, mental energy. Yep. It's just like not intelligence, just energy. Like it requires a lot of staring down someone, talking to them, having different thoughts, listening and more, you know, not this, like you said, surface self-care. It's like surface conversation. It's if you're used to just like kind of the, hey, how's it going, Jerry? You know, blah, blah, blah. It's a real large leap to get into something really deep, you know. And I understand that completely because I can't tell you like <laughs> it takes me so long to get through a book. It takes yeah. me so sometimes so long even to get through a lecture I'm listening to yeah. because uh, I'm pressing pause all the time. Yeah. Because I, I read a line in the book and I'm just like, oh, I got to think about that. So yeah. hit and put the bookmarker in, set it down, and I've got to process it. So I understand that I understand the, the the mental energy that it takes to process big ideas because I'm constantly searching and trying to do that every day all the time in my life and it, and it it really interrupts life yeah. it really does yeah. it interrupts like to 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 what we've been saying it interrupts our homeostasis that's right yeah because it, because it requires so much concentration yeah. And what, what do most of us want to do? Netflix and chill, just right? just want to be distracted, you know? You yeah. want to, like, dive within. Okay, we're geniuses again. Okay, we're back. Yeah. <laughs> we're back. We, you know, we, we vacillate in between uh, imbeciles and genius. <laughs> like, yeah, well, you know, that's, that's, you know. That's, that's being blonde, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. <laughs> yeah, well, oh, Simon, thank you so much, my friend. Again, this always a great time, man. Seriously. Yeah, thank you. I always feel so energized after our conversations. Really? I, I just feel like I'm ready to meet the next week now because I've, yeah. I've, I've kind of had this like purging. You purge it, yeah. Yeah, and, and also uh, seeing things from your perspective, you know, which now, now, I've, now I've got to feed that back into my yeah. machine. Now I've got to like, you know, put that information back into my process. That's right. And it's just energizing to now have that to, to go off of for the next week or two, you know, until our next conversation, yep, you know, sure. so. Awesome, man. Thank you so much for being my friend and for wanting to do this regularly. I really appreciate it. I as well, man.